Okay, let's flip to page 81 of the text and keep working at this. We're trying to establish something about neurosis and its relation to the symbolic in order to help us, in turn, establish something about psychosis and its foreclosure of any typical relation to the symbolic. Page 81. Toward the bottom of the page, about two-thirds of the way down, there's a sentence that starts, the young child whom you see playing. It's in the paragraph that says, this hasn't been demonstrated. The young child whom you see playing at making an object disappear and reappear, who is thereby working at apprehending the symbol, will let, will, if you let yourselves be fascinated by him, mask the fact that the symbolic is already there, that it is enormous and englobes him from all sides, that language exists, fills libraries to the point of overflowing, and surrounds, guides, and rouses all your actions. The fact that you are engaged, that it can require you to move at any moment and take you somewhere, all this you forget before the child being introduced into the symbolic dimension. So let us place ourselves at the level of the existence of the symbol as such, insofar as we are immersed in it. So let's start at the beginning of this lengthy sentence. The young child whom you see playing at making objects disappear and reappear, who is thereby working at apprehending the symbol. All right. This is from a 1920 book that Freud wrote called Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And in that book, Freud notices something that his grandson, Ernst, is doing. Here's the story. Freud's hanging out, and his daughter brings her son over. This was a typical occurrence, he says, where she brings her son over and drops him off in order to go do whatever it is she's going to do. Freud was a little judgy about this whole thing. He thought his mom, the mom should be spending a little more time with the child. Nevertheless, as any happy grandfather is, he embraced the opportunity to spend some time with his kid, his grandkid. And here's something that he noticed. He was stunned that when the mom would drop off the kid, the kid was never really sad when she left, or at least didn't express it. The mom would come over, drop the kid in the little baby cage, the play pen or whatever you would call it back then, and the child would do something that Freud noticed, something that Freud thought helped the child cope with the mother's absence. Now, back in these days, in a crib or a baby cage, or whatever you want to call these things, there was something around the edge of the crib, like a padded blanket of sorts, that would allow the kid to have some warmth, allow the kid to have some privacy, and so forth. It was a screen, though, effectively. Keep the kid from bumping its head on the bars, all this kind of stuff. You can't use these things anymore because they turns out they suffocate kids when they roll into them and stuff like this. But back in the day, remember this is 1920 when he writes this book, this was allowed. And in this case, Ernst gets put into this baby playpen. It's surrounded by a blanket and he can't really see out. And you can't really see in unless you peer over it. And he's in there and he's got this toy, another early 20th century baby hazard. It's a little spool with a piece of string attached to it. A spool that may have had yarn wrapped around it at some point, and that typically a child would play with by um, pulling the string and having the spool run behind them as though it's a little wagon, um, pulling the string and having the spool go behind them like it's an animal, whatever the case may be, swinging it around perhaps, whatever. Not so with Ernst. When the mom would drop him off, he did something very interesting with this spool, according to Freud. He'd sit in his playpen, and he would take the string in one hand and the spool in the other, and he would throw the spool over the side of his crib so that it disappeared 
onto the outside of his crib, past the little blanket edging beyond which Ernst couldn't see. And when he threw it over the crib and out of his sight, he would say, he would make a sound that Freud interpreted as the German word fort, which means away. And then because Ernst had the string in his other hand, he would pull this string and reel the spool back in so that it popped over the top of his crib and reappeared to him. And when this happened, Freud says, Ernst would make a different sound. He would grab the spool, pull it close to him, and make a sound that according to Freud sounded like da, which in German can mean there, but also can mean here. And then, crucially, Ernst would repeat the game. He would throw the spool back over the edge of the crib, say fort, away, and then pull it back to him and say da here when he gets it. And he'd do this again and again. Now, how are we to understand this? Freud is not able to make much of this, except to say that the child is mastering at the level of a game what he can't control at the level of real life. In this case, the spool is the mother. It's a symbol of the mom, of Ernst's mom. And he can't control his mom's comings and goings. She comes and goes as she pleases. She drops him off and then leaves. And he doesn't know when she's coming back. Not so with the spool. The spool that is symbolic of her, he can control. He can control when it leaves by throwing it over the edge of the crib. He can control when it comes back by deciding when to pull the string and reel it back in. What Freud here says is that the child is able to exercise some control at the level of a game over an entity that it can't control in real life, namely its mom. What Lacan brings to this is a very keen insight, namely, the spool is a symbol. The spool symbolizes the mom. It is a primitive symbolization. It's the symbol, in other words, of loss, of absence, of what is gone, what the child can't control. It's happening at the level of a game, and that is precisely what the symbolic is. It is, in particular, the rules of the game. It's the game as shored up by rules, which determine positions, which determine places, the game that Ernst is playing is the game of the symbolic. And it's a game determined by symbols where things stand for other things. In this case, the spool stands for the mom. Now, what does the mother in this example symbolize? She symbolizes Ernst's pre-symbolic baby-like existence, the world that is lost to him as soon as he enters the game of the symbolic. That's crucial here. To embrace the symbolization of the mother at the level of the spool is to embrace the symbol, the spool, as a prohibition, as a negation, as a no. And what it negates, what it prohibits, is the world in which mother would never leave child behind. The world of infancy, perhaps. If Ernst was just born, and the mom gave Ernst to his grandfather, Sigmund Freud, and said, here, take care of this baby, it wouldn't be impossible for Freud to do this. I did this with my little kid when she was first born. I can remember having a little eyedropper and feeding this little tiny baby every three hours for days and days and days after she was born. It can be done, but it would not have been easy. It would have been easier for Ernst to stay and perhaps nurse with his mom. Now maybe that's what happened, but if it didn't happen, it'd be a real struggle. In the case of Ernst, by the time he shows up at his grandfather's house, he knows that that world of primitive 
ceaseless connection, perhaps by umbilical cord, perhaps by breast to his mother, is gone. And he symbolizes that loss at the level of the symbolic. He symbolizes it with the spool. The spool is not just symbolic of mom who is gone, it is symbolic of a world that is lost. 